Okay, well, it's uh, just a, a quick update on uh, some technical aspects of the Chronos and also how we are leveraging the, uh, the project to have, uh, you know, side projects or, or to uh, seek uh, additional funding. I think that was one of the things that we wanted to do with this project is to bring uh, additional funding and also, uh, you know, partnerships with the private company. So at the end, I will explain a little bit on that. Uh, let me remind you what we are doing with Kronos here. <clears throat> As Tyson explained, uh, there is, a, there is a, a focus on doing soil plant atmosphere uh, monitoring. And in this case, we are not using regular soil moisture sensors, you know, with two or three prongs. And the idea is to have something is non-invasive uh, and something that actually covers the entire area of the field. So that can give us the, the average of the field so that we can have a better representation of the soil moisture conditions. And also we can probably uh, compare that to remote sensing uh, sources. So that's, that's the, the unique idea. And also the technology is fairly new. So there is a motivation for doing research. And what you see here is on the, I don't know, the laser, but this one uh, right here, the VF3 system is the, uh, the system that we started to use at the beginning of the experiment. Okay. There you go. So this is the, the first system that we started to use. And this is a new system that is made by uh, Radiation Detection Technologies. It's a, a spin-off uh, company of uh, nuclear engineering in K-State. Basically, PhD students that uh, develop a cool technology and decided to start their own company. K-State helped them a little bit, and they actually hosting the entire company inside of the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Uh, they look very similar, but there is a $10,000 difference in cost. So we are already <laughs> cutting this one costs twenty thousand dollars. This one costs about ten thousand dollars. What you see here is actually an open version of this one right here, and there are three modules that monitor this shower of uh, subatomic particles. And so, someone Hardeep presented a neutron probe. This is similar principle, but instead of having an active source of radiation, it actually monitors the background radiation. And these uh, fast moving particles are related to the hydrogen in the biosphere. So we can actually, if we remove the source of hydrogen in the vapor, uh, in the water vapor in the atmosphere, if we remove that in the, uh, in the biomass, we can actually infer what is the soil moisture condition in the field. It doesn't give you any information about the spatial variability, it just give you that average for the entire field. So it has also some limitations. And what you see here is, uh, you know, once we, we tested, we proved that they are pretty much giving the same uh, information. They are really accurate. Uh, then we order uh, six more. And this is, uh, the, we developed or the, we deploy them by the, uh, the Manhattan station of the Kansas Mesonet for about a week. And then we ship uh, three of uh, these detectors to Oklahoma State. And uh, now we are looking forward to, to deploy these uh, sensors in the field. Um, so. And this actually is the, uh, the very first paper that came out of the, of the Kronos project that was published a few years ago, a few years, a few weeks ago. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I wish it was a few years ago. <laughs> so uh, as I show, you know, maybe in this one I need to point out that, or remind you that there is a, a camera and with that we monitor a uh, plant canopy. And this is one of the first, uh, you know, time series of canopy cover that we recorded at the Flickner Innovation Fund here in Mount Ridge. Uh, this was a soybean field. Uh, and we look at the images and we started to look at these patterns of canopy cover where we thought that there was something wrong with the camera. Um, but then we actually started looking at the images and we started looking that that was actually real. So it was the uh, canopy cover about 70% at 9 a.m. And by the middle of the day, the canopy cover reduced by 50%. Um, and that was captured, you know, by, by the camera. And so, you know, we have soil moisture conditions that are monitored by the chronos and the atmospheric conditions. So now we can start relate uh, these uh, sub-daily canopy changes with the additional, additional variables that we are monitoring. And one of the main things here is, you know, can models capture this kind of dynamics at this scale? Uh, you know, here we are certainly not transpiring very much. We are not capturing light. The soil is warming up, so maybe we are increasing that E uh, component. And so this is part of what we want to do with Kronos. We, uh, if the models can not, you know, capture this very well, at least we are looking at a way of capturing this with, you know, with hardware and trying to feed this information into the models. Now, I'm not sure how, that, how hard or easy that would be, 
uh, but this is what we are looking for. Trying to, again, not use sometimes overly complicated models, but make use of instruments that we have available. And this is actually a time lapse that we created with uh, many of the images. We were taking images about uh, from nine to what, uh, maybe 6 p.m. every three hours. Uh, you will see that everything is fine. We are in the 30th of July. And as soon as we are hitting about uh, August 15th or August 20th, you will see this, this pulses of opening, you know, fully expanded canopy and, and then a partially closed canopy due to the stress. You can see that already there a little bit. And that happens pretty much every day. So kind of interesting to see all these all these dynamics being captured by by instruments. So that's actually the part where the search was the most intense. And also talks about the relationship between you know supply and demand of the atmosphere. So early in the in the morning, late in, in the evening, maybe the plants can cope with the atmospheric conditions. Okay. But how can we take this to the next level? That's just canopy. So we are doing some uh, deep learning uh, research, and the idea is to also capture not only bare soil, uh, sorry, canopy, but also bare soil and crop residue. So now we can have a time lapse imagery with you know residue decomposition or how the entire you know all three components are evolving over time. Um, and this actually was you know money, quantifying green canopy cover was fairly straightforward. Now quantifying residue was a much more difficult problem. So in this case. We had to process nearly 4,000 images. Each image has 250,000 pixels. And so we ended up labeling near a billion uh, pixels. Uh, with, some, with some assistance of the computers, but you know, there was a student behind you know, deciding which pixels were canopy, which pixels were bare soil, and which pixels were residue. And this is an example of how you know, it's actually pretty accurate uh, for images are very similar to uh, the, the training example. And so it works pretty well, I would say, in 80, 90% of the cases. And this also brings some, you know, um, the idea is to create a tool that can help us to assess the impact of, uh, you know, soil and water conservation practices, conservation tillage, you know, that we can, we can uh, use this to quantify. This is already, or the goal is to have, again, a web based tool where people don't need to install anything. They can just go and upload this. It should be, uh, you know, uh, working mobile devices uh, and everything happens in, in real time. So it's pretty good. Yes, some other examples. So here would be a, a full wheat canopy. You can see maybe that capturing residue, maybe it's not residue, it's just some dead leaves. You know, that's part of the error of the, uh, of the method. This will be just a, you know, recently harvested, I think it was probably corn. Uh, also capturing some weeds there, you know, hard to see on the original image, but the, certainly the, uh, the, the machine captured that, you know, full residue and then partial residue cover here. Um, so. so one of the uh, things that we tried to do in the past year was also trying to leverage uh, additional funding. Uh, we actually were successful to secure a, a grant with the NRCS to develop a set of a coordinated soil moisture uh, test beds. Um, there is one already, is the Marina Oklahoma Institute test bed, where they, uh, you know, test has been running this for what, 10, 12 years. And they basically have all sorts of uh, soil moisture sensing technologies from regular sensors to, you know, the, the Cosmos that we are using, GPS sensors, and all sorts of other, uh, you know, uh, hardware related to soil moisture monitoring from different research groups across, across the country. And it serves as a platform for comparing these technologies. And so what we wanted to do is to maybe uh, add a little more uh, input to this one, renovate it, uh, and then also deploy uh, three more across the country. So there will be one in uh, K-State, there will be one in Texas A&M, and there will be one in the USDA ARS in uh, LSB, Maryland. They will have something like what you see here, there will be a central, a central uh, piece of land with these technologies and then three additional replications in, in one field. So four replicates per site. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, a tentative site for, for Kansas State will be perhaps the field with, uh, uh, you know, with NEON. Uh, I'm not sure that field already has a lot of instruments, but the, the idea is to, again, to leverage existing infrastructure and trying to develop this kind of a 
test beds for comparing technology. So if you have any suggestion or any you know, new technology that, 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 that you will be interested in, in testing, let me know because we are just about to start with this. We haven't found the, the land, but we need to order instruments. So it will be good to have some input uh, before we, we go ahead and break the ground. And then the last one is about evapor uh, transpiration partitioning. This is some progress that Dr. Santos has made in the uh, past year or so with one of his students. Uh, this is a picture of it's in the it was uh, Eddie Covariance uh, set up at the Neon Station, where we also have a chrono station. Uh, this will be a micro lysimeter. It's basically a, a piece of PVC PV tube that is driven into the ground. And then we need to go every day and take the mass so we know how much evaporation there was. The idea here is to isolate the soil from the roots so we know exactly that it was E and not T. And this is, you know, we need a lot of them because we need to capture, represent a large piece of land or the, the footprint of this instrument is about the entire field. And so we need lots of them. <laughs> and, you know, going every day, take them out of the ground, put them in the scale, put them back in the hole, uh, it, it can be pretty labor uh, you know, intensive. So, and these are some of the uh, preliminary uh, findings and the micro lysimeters and the, uh, the, you know, the, the instrument uh, that, or the methodology based on the instruments uh, do not agree very well, I mean, to some extent, but there is some discrepancy there. And I think this is the, uh, the importance of having always, even when it takes a lot of time and work to do it in the field, to have some uh, ground validation, some in situ data to really validate indirect methods of uh, monitoring this case uh, with the ET. Eduardo, I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the methods, so you don't know, the methods that uh, they use to form this microlytic. Okay, thank you. And that's about all.